good morning, everyone. It's just me today. Uh, Steve's off working, so doing his pilot thing. So it's just going to be me this morning. Uh, we're going to go over pre-composting, but first I'll give everybody a few minutes to uh, get on here and log on for those that are just trying to get up and logged into YouTube. Hey to uh, Sunshine Farm in South Jersey. We've got several people from Colorado today, uh, Atlanta, or a couple people from Georgia, South Florida, Philly, SoCal. Good to see everybody. It's warm today here. We've got temps into the 50s, so it's uh, not really feeling like winter. It's kind of weird. Um, anyway, uh, I'm not used to it's been a we had our long break and then uh, Steve and I were back, so it's kind of weird to get used to uh, have to do this by myself again. But um, we'll get going in just a minute here. Let every, more people check in. Hey Scott, hey Scorch, welcome back, everybody. Hey Susan, welcome again. Hawaii, Aloha, St. Louis. Hey Scott from Idaho. <laughs> Excuse me, one second. I got to take a drink quick. All right, let me uh, get this banner down and then I will get things going here. Here we go. And let me get this up. Uh, I must have accidentally clicked on somebody's comment. So give me one second. So uh, I don't know what, how I did that. There we go. Sorry about that. All right. So today, uh, January 18th, we're going to talk about pre-composting. And let me get up to that part. So uh, I've done composting for uh, coming up on 12 years now where I've uh, composted professionally. And uh, I first heard this term pre-composting at the uh, NC State Vermiculture Conference. And I was left a bit confused, like what, what would pre-composting be? That doesn't really make sense. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about what pre-composting is. So for, for those of you who have heard that term and are just like me who were like, what the heck is that? That's what we're gonna talk about. So pre-composting 101, what is pre-composting? Uh, we'll talk about how to pre-compost and then we'll just get into a little bit on the effects on bin production or how things are gonna go and then we'll do our regular Q&A at the end. So getting started here. What is pre-composting? It's really just composting. Uh, it's called pre-composting because we're doing it before we're feeding it to our worms. But really, essentially, it's just composting in the regular sense that you would compost in multiple ways, which we'll talk about in the next slide. But it's just a matter of putting browns and greens or nitrogen uh, green material, when we use that term in composting, we're talking about nitrogenous or nitrogen containing material, food scraps, coffee grounds, uh, grass, things that you cut green, manure, uh, things that are tend to be higher in nitrogen, obviously. And then when we talk about browns, we're talking about carbonaceous material. So straw, sticks, stalks, wood chips, uh, leaves, paper, cardboard, all things like that. So um, we're putting those browns and greens together and by composting before we're feeding to the worms, we're beginning the decomposition process and we're reducing the particle size. So uh, for those of you who tend to do food scraps, which I'm sure are most of you who are feeding food scraps, you know, like when you peel a banana and you put the little pieces of banana peel in your worm bin, it takes a really long time, at least, you know, a few weeks for that to break down. And even for it to start breaking down, you know, it, it looks bruised and things like that, but it doesn't really start to reduce in particle size. Uh, so a few, I don't remember when that was, but we had talked about uh, ways of preparing compost to feed to our worms. And one of that thing was reducing particle size uh, so that it helps to break things down even quicker. So that's what pre-composting is going to do, but what pre-composting is really, why it's really beneficial, even different from what we were talking about a few weeks back when we're just uh, preparing ingredients to re by reducing the particle size is that by composting, we're increasing our microorganisms. So starting the composting process, we have bacteria and fungi that are moving in and starting to break things down. Uh, 
making particle size smaller and increasing their populations. And by increasing those microorganism populations, we've got uh, more of what the worms want to eat. So worms uh, work their way. I use the term chew. Uh, they're not, they, you know, they don't have teeth, so they're not actually chewing. It's just a uh, analogy, but uh, they're chewing through material. And as they're working through their way through material, they're actually gaining their nutrients from these microorganisms. So the microorganisms are what they want. So that's why pre-composting is uh, so effective is that you're incorporating these microorganisms into your bin from the beginning. So pre-composting can be done in a static manner or an active manner. And those are terms for composting. So static composting is when you that's what most people do in their backyard where they just throw things into a pile, don't really do much with it and just let it break down over time or they'll toss it into a garbage can or some type of bin and just not really do anything with it, allow it to break down for a year or so and then use it. Active composting is um, just like it sounds, you're actively managing the compost by turning it with a pitchfork or a machine um, you're working with the material to incorporate more air and manage the piles so that your uh, different people have different um, objectives when they're trying to uh, make compost. Mine, when I'm doing compost, I'm trying to get things to heat up, but my focus is on the microbial population. So you've got static or active composting. You've also got mesophilic or thermophilic composting, which may be new terms to some of you. So mesophilic composting is cold composting. A lot of people often refer to static composting as mesophilic or cold composting, but static composting can also heat up. So that may be confusing. Uh, but mesophilic is really, um, it refers to the microorganisms, especially the bacteria that are working away at this material. So these are, uh, these are organisms that prefer more comfortable temps like you and I like, you know, from 30 degrees up to a little over 100 degrees, whereas thermophilic Composting uh, refers to the thermophilic organisms that are taking over in that material as it heats up. So thermophilic organisms like uh, temperatures that are higher at or higher than uh, 45 degrees Celsius or 113 degrees Fahrenheit. So they're the ones, that's why we call it thermophilic composting because they're, the thermophiles take over and uh, start to work at this material and break it down. And then pre-composting, uh, most people are, if they're doing this type of thing, uh, you wanna do it, you wanna allow your material to break down for at least six to 12 weeks. Um, I mean, you can let it break down for a year or two if you wanna do, let it for that long, but at least six weeks up, up to 12 weeks is gonna allow. <laughs> and then when I take a drink of water, it makes me cough more. Uh, it's gonna allow uh, that decomposition to start to take place where you're uh, after, especially after 12 weeks, if you're looking at that material, you can't really necessarily tell what the banana peel is from a apple core and things like that. And then we also wanna consider because we are putting together browns and greens when we're pre-composting, as we feed this to the worms, we consider it both food and bedding. So you don't necessarily need to add a bunch more, like when you're feeding food scraps, you're adding in brown material or bedding material that you're balancing out the nitrogen with carbon. So you just need to consider your ratios that when you're pre-composting this stuff, you've already got your browns and greens together. You may wanna add just a tiny bit more brown material and you, uh, we'll talk about that in the next slide, but you'll especially wanna add that stuff and cover it because that's gonna reduce your, uh, what people would consider pests. So, how do we pre-compost? Uh, just making a quick note here. Um, pre-composting can be done the same way that you do any type of compost. So um, a compost pile, just like what's pictured here, you know, either in this type of bin system or just by itself, you don't necessarily have to have something surrounding it. You could just make a pile of compost. Um, you can use some type of bin, any type of composting bin out there. So I'm not a big fan of the tumblers or those ones that don't allow a lot of air in, but it is a method of uh, composting. So that's something that you could do to uh, prepare this stuff before you feed it to the worms. And then ASP is short for 
aerated static piles, and that's maybe a new term to some of you also. Uh, that's something that we can talk about in a future Wiggle Wednesday. It would be a good topic. Uh, aerated static piles um, uh, have air pipes that lay on the lay on the ground, and they're either forced air or uh, negative. I can't think of the term right now. Uh, where they're pulling air. So most of them are forced air systems where they're you pile stuff on top of pipes, plastic pipes, and then you push air up through there to add oxygen to it. Um, and you can look into ASP on the, you can Google that. I'm not going to get into more details on that. Um, Bokashi, some people like the Bokashi method. Uh, I'm not necessarily a fan because it's all anaerobic and doesn't really have much diversity. It's almost all lactobacillus. Uh, but it can be a way for people who like are in an apartment who don't really have the option of having an outdoor pile or a bin or anything like that. So they can keep a Bakashi bucket um, and then break stuff down and then feed it to the worms after it's broken down. Uh, black soldier fly larva could also be considered a way of pre-composting in a way because you're getting that material broken down. Uh, so I just added that in there as well. So BSF stands for black soldier flies and people use black soldier fly larva to eat away at food scraps and it kind of makes a mushy material that then you can feed to worms. So uh, if you, it, you know, these are just a few of the methods of composting. There are lots of different methods. There's also in vessel composting, which is similar to Bokashi. It's a, it's an anaerobic form of, of uh, composting that you put uh, all your food scraps along with brown material into something and uh, don't allow air in there and it's called in-vessel composting. So any type of composting uh, you can do for pre-composting and then feed it to your worms. And then like I mentioned, when you do feed it to your worms, you want to add a bin, uh, add to the bin with a thin layer and cover with bedding. So uh, I just wanted to make a note of this is like when you're we normally tell people to put, you know, a quarter to a half inch of food scraps and bedding when you're when you're putting those in to feed your worms, uh, keeping it to a quarter inch to a half inch and then allowing them time to process it. With pre composted material, and we've mentioned this in other Wiggle Wednesdays or other videos, um, because you're getting the material to break down already, the worms are going to process it a lot quicker. So you know, you can up that to at least a half an inch to maybe even an inch or a little bit more. Um, you know, people know like how active their worms are depending on temperature and climate and things like that. So just kind of pay attention to that. But you can add a little bit more thicker layer than you would with regular food scraps because it's already begun that decomposition process. And you'll, we'll, we'll get into that with the next slide, but uh, you can add a layer of that. And then again, you would want to cover it with at least a thin bit of bedding and that just prevents flies, gnats, fungus, uh, fungus, flies, gnats, um, fruit flies is what I was trying to think of, uh, from landing on there and laying eggs and giving you some pests in your bin. Uh, and then just the effects on bin production, you're going to notice that there's a lot quicker, a uh, lot faster processing of the material. So Whereas like I was mentioning in the beginning of this Wiggle Wednesday, you know, you put an apple core or banana peels into your bin and you're watching those things for weeks to break down and not seeing much action until, you know, after a month or whatever. Whereas if you're pre-composting material, you've really gotten a good start on that decomposition and added a lot of microorganisms, which the worms are going to love. And they're going to tear through that material a lot faster, uh, at least three times faster usually even more than that. So um, for someone with uh, like a continuous flow bin or one of those stackable bins, like I've used the uh, stackable bins where you're, uh, you fill up, you fill up one bin and then stack another one on top of it and use that stacking method. And man, you can, you can feed this stuff to the worms and they'll go through it really quickly. And you can just really, um, make castings very quickly but also for those stackable type bins i found um usually you've got worms that linger in the lower levels more worms that linger in the lower levels that are still working on stuff but when you're using pre-composted material you're really getting those worms to move with the material better and you don't have those lingering populations that are stuck in the lower bins that don't move up into the higher bins so that's one thing that i've noticed as well so 
lots of benefits, uh, not, not lots, but I mean, great benefits from uh, pre-composting because you're going to get, you know, for someone who's trying to make money off of this, you, you're going to get castings in less time. So you're making more, getting more out the door and able to make more money. So um, plus it's an easy way of providing free, free food. Uh, I mean, that's why most people are doing this anyway, is that they're using it to get rid of waste and provide uh, free fertilizer for their gardens. So um, I don't really have much more than that on this. And with that, we'll go to the Q&A and I'm going to get out of this screen so I can see your else comment. And I forgot to mention in the beginning that uh, I wasn't going to be able to see comments, but it doesn't look like I have any questions. Um, does anybody have any questions that you want to type in the comments? Unless for some reason my uh, thing's not updating here. I can't hit update screen, otherwise it'll uh, remove me from this whole live stream. So hopefully my computer is working. Um, I'm going to go search through questions real quick here. Uh, I, I just recall I did have some questions on an email today that someone was asking about. Oh, here's a question. I have a lot of little fly-like bugs crawling around. I'm guessing your question, there's not a question with that. That's just a statement, but I'm guessing you're wondering what to do with that. Um, so uh, we have a great uh, worm bin pests uh, blog post that you can read all about that. Um, it depends on what it is, but the most likely cure for it or what's going to help is for uh, the you to leave the lid off for a day or two and just allow some air in there. And that usually clears things up with gnats and flies. Um, along with put like I was mentioning in this uh, today, you know, keeping a thin layer of brown material like shredded cardboard or shredded paper or leaves on the top of your bin. That way that fruit flies and flies and uh, gnats and things like that aren't going to come in, aren't as likely to come in and lay eggs. Uh, let's see. Is pre-composted horse manure good for an urban worm bag? Uh, yes. I, the only thing about horse manure is that you have to be cautious of them eating um, persistent herbicides. So as long as you know that your horses, uh, as well as uh, dewormers, a lot of horses are on dewormers and that's going to work against our cause. But yes, um, I, use, I use broken down horse manure. I've got some horses across from where I currently live and I go over there and uh, get broken down stuff and I'll add that to my compost or just feed it broken down manure. Uh, somebody else had any advice on pre-composting with horse manure. Um, I don't really have any advice other than uh, if you're getting green horse manure, you definitely want to pre-compost and then let it break down. Otherwise, you can also, you know, take um, with any type of manure, I always recommend that you want it to have aged enough to where like if you were to pick it up and kind of squeeze it with your fingers, it's going to be crumbly and either, you know, really break apart or at least be uh, dried out enough and and have aged enough to where it's starting to crumble and fall apart and not be gooey and uh, sticky. How do I raise the pH in my bin? Uh, so I was just writing something about this earlier. Um, I want to specify that this is a Band-Aid approach. So people use lime, just a sprinkling of lime in their bin. That's going to help to raise the pH. But that is not getting at the root cause of why your pH is low in the first place. So a lot of people like to just automatically use lime because they think that uh, it's going to help their bin when, like I said, it's only a Band-Aid approach. What you want to be doing is making sure that you're adding enough brown material so that you're, what normally happens is that people are adding too much food or green nitrogenous material and uh, things start to go anaerobic, which makes things acidic and just starts to cause more and more problems in your bin. So that's usually rectified by making sure you're always adding uh, one to one or two browns to one green when you're feeding your worms. Uh, Barbara asked, what are they? I don't, there's lots of different pests. So I would uh, urge you to check out our blog posts because I don't, there's lots of different things with that look different and I can't tell you just from you saying that they're flies. Um, what are the best foods for worms? 
any type of organic material. Um, I mean, if you're trying to fatten up worms for some reason, you can use a commercial worm chow. But other than that, uh, worms, just like in the wild, they're going to be breaking down, you know, leaves, uh, things that are going to generally turn into soil. So food scraps, leaves, uh, shredded paper, anything that's made from an organic source. So, And when I say organic, I don't mean like FDA or USDA organic. I mean like organic carbon containing, like it is made from life. Uh, can starting bedding in a worm bin be 100% pre-composted material? Uh, I would recommend at least adding a bit of bedding uh, and then adding or mixing a little bit of bedding in with the pre-composted material. Um, I've tried doing just uh, pre-composted material before and um, it held a little bit too much. It already had a lot of moisture in there and I didn't add bedding to kind of pull some of that moisture out and it caused a little bit of problems. So um, monitor moisture and I would always add a little bit of bedding in with the pre-composted material as well. Do uh, Next question, do you advise against adding acidic food scraps like lemons or limes? Um, so no, I don't advise against adding acidic foods, especially if you're pre-composting. That's the other thing I guess I should have mentioned in this. Uh, a lot of people are uh, questionable or leery or don't just straight up don't use uh, citrus fruits or onions because they've heard uh, or read online that uh, it, it can harm worms. Um, so there's the, I always forget if it's a citric acid or citrulline in, in citrus that there's a, the acid harms uh, the skin of a worm, but worms can, if you put that stuff straight into a bin, worms can stay away from it while that breaks down over a day or whatever. But especially if you're pre-composting, all that stuff's getting broken down and it's going to do no harm to your worms because it's been breaking down and getting worked by microorganisms for at least six weeks if you follow my recommendations. Uh, and then how about avocado pits? You can put avocado pits in a bin. They're going to take years to break down, though. Um, they just take a long, long time. Uh, would 21-day compost be considered pre-compost, or would you need a maturation period? Matura uh, I cannot say that word today. Maturation period. Uh, 21 days. Um, it's going to begin the decomposition process. Uh, it... It, it's going to help at least. It's more than just putting, you know, your straight up banana peels into the bin. So um, I would, based on years of experience, 21 days is just not long enough for compost. And um, I don't know how many times I hear it from other people that compost, you can make compost in 21 days. It's That's just not physically possible. Uh, you just don't get stuff to break down and be fully broken down or even partially broken down in 21 days. Uh, so I would recommend longer. And any opinion on pre-composting fall and leaves? Uh, I do it. Uh, can we keep BSF together with worms? Uh, it's not suggested because black soldier fly, fly larvae will outcompete worms for food and they will overtake a bin likely. How long should pre-composting take place? Uh, watch the video. It says six to 12 weeks is what I recommended. Uh, until you see me for... You don't, the, so material, the question is until you see uh, materials uniform or is there a window of time? Uh, you want to do it for at least six weeks. That's when you're going to get a good breakdown. You know, it all depends on the starting size of your material. Rabbit poop need, or is it good to pre-compost? Um, I just talked about manure, uh, so just follow those recommendations. So for aging manure, put it in the sun rather than in a layer with food scraps and carbonates. Yeah, uh, so I would just let it age, you know, in the field or, or let it, you know, lay out. Don't pile it up to let it dry you want to allow the sun and the air to dry that stuff out to age it when referring to any type of manure, uh, horse manure, rabbit manure, or anything like that. Uh, I mean, I've put rabbit manure in buckets and let it, let it sit as long as it can get air, it's going to dry out over time. Do home bio essays on horse manure? To, oh, it's not a question. 
Uh, yeah, thank you for the recommendation. You can do bioassay on horse manure. So if you're making a compost with horse manure, um, you can do what's called a bioassay. That's a whole other topic. We can talk about some other time, but you can look up uh, NC State uh, bioassay and Google that and, and it'll give you how to do that. Hey, Michigan Soil Works. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, we've got close to 100 people here. Why does overfeeding cause anaerobic conditions instead of composting? Is composting done in anaerobic conditions? So uh, overfeeding causes anaerobic conditions because uh, usually it's because of the structure. Uh, when you're putting nothing but food scraps in, you don't really have much porosity. And so it's a lot about the porosity in there where you're not getting oxygen to uptake into that material. So by uh, it's decomposing and as it's decomposing, it's you know going from this to like this and it's closing all those pores. So it slowly, slowly, slowly loses more and more oxygen. And so you're going anaerobic to where anaerobic microorganisms take over. Uh, and that can be detrimental because anaerobic microorganisms can and do, uh, not necessarily in your compost, but they can make uh, alcohol and phenols, which are gonna kill plants. Um, composting is done in anaerobic conditions and you can compost in anaerobic conditions like the uh, Bokashi, but uh, once you take those, once you take material out of uh, the anaerobic conditions, and expose it to oxygen, uh, that air is gonna help aerobic organisms to take over the anaerobic microorganisms and that material is slowly gonna become aerobic and, and better. Uh, question is, do you add grit when uh, pre-comp, do you add grit when you use pre-compost? If you do include it in the pre-composting process, do you add it when you feed the worms? Uh, Generally, by pre-composting, you're adding a lot of material that's going to be considered grit anyway, but um, you could really do either one. You can sprinkle stuff in there. I mean, <clears throat> money-wise, if you're purchasing something that you're using for grit, it's going to be you're getting more bang for your buck if you're feeding, uh, adding the grit when you're feeding the worms because then you can just sprinkle a tiny bit in and you're not losing it to the compost pile or you know if it's in the compost pile and it rains that grit so small it can work it way it work its way down to the bottom of the pile and you know go out into the soil where you're losing it so i would i would recommend you know putting it in when you're feeding the worms what's the purpose of eggshells in the bin are worms able to actually feed on them does it act as a grit on the bin j yes uh so the purpose of eggshells the the purpose Sorry, I'm going too fast here. The reason that people put eggshells in their bin is because uh, if you grind them up, it works as a grit and um, it can also have other functions where the calcium from the eggshells can help to adjust pH uh, for people who are having some acidic conditions. Uh, and then eggshells, oh, there was one other thing I was gonna say. Um, the calcium for worms. So uh, that added calcium can also help worms. Uh, but eggshells are going to take a long time to break down. Um, and they're, and eggshells are going to re rely on like a physical grinding. So, you know, in a compost pile, as you're turning the compost, they're going to get moved around and those eggshells are going to grind up. But if you're, uh, if they're not getting that physical grinding from other actions, you're going to want to uh, you maybe dry them out and put them through a grinder or something like that to reduce them in particle size to then turn that into a grid. Next question. Once a thermophilic compost pile falls under 121, when would you recommend adding worms? Uh, what temperature does off-gassing remain an issue? Um, so the temperature you're referring to should be 131. Um, that's the composting temperature. Um, well, so uh, this is a this can be a really long answer. I'll try and keep it short. Uh, when a when a material falls below 131 degrees, um, you'd want it really a lot closer to 100 degrees before you're feeding it to worms. Uh, what can happen though is if you're not turning that pile and adding oxygen, um, you can get a drop in temperature and you think it's finished. But then if you turn it or do something with the material to add oxygen 
it can activate all those microbes and send it up above 131 degrees again. So uh, you want to make sure that you actually are finishing having compost that's finishing off and coming down in temperature and not going to increase if you're adding air. So I would uh, wait till the material is at least 100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit or less before you're adding it to worms. And I'm not sure what you mean by what temperature does off-gassing remain an issue. Um, I'm looking for more questions here and I've just got a lot of comments. You're welcome, everyone. Thanks for the, thank, thank you for the thank yous. It's good to be appreciated. How, uh, question, how would you bring down pH in a worm bin? Um, Oh man, I'm having a blank on the material. There's a, there's a material, so like you add lime to increase the, uh, increase it. There's a material that you can add to lower the pH. Uh, but again, that's likely do so. Uh, pH can, pH is affected by microbial action. So if you've got a ton of bacterial action happening, you're going to get a raise in pH because bacteria put out enzymes that are more alkaline. And so again, adding more brown material is going to help to uh, balance that out. So putting in more brown bedding, brown carbonaceous material should help to bring down the pH in a bit. Uh, and I'm just, I'm sorry, but I'm drawing a blank right now on that thing, on the stuff that you can add in there that's organic and natural. Um, how do you test the pH that you can buy test strips or testers or um, electric testers? Uh, Michigan Soil Works says, in his experience, three weeks, tw the, the question before from 21 days of real thermophilic and a couple weeks of cooling down is all you need for continuous flow. So he's saying, he's saying three weeks plus a couple of weeks of cooling down. So that's five weeks. Uh, so again, that's close to six weeks. But um, again, three weeks isn't enough, but you're going to need to allow it to mature past three weeks. So, um, thanks for that. Thanks for that adding in your experience there. Um, cause yeah, getting, if you're getting it to heat up for three weeks and then allowing it to cool, or even if it's still a bit hot after six weeks, it should start to cool once you're, uh, breaking it down into smaller parts and feeding it to your worms. My seed question, my seed warming mat used to keep the bin warm is drying out the top layer of bedding. Is this okay? So uh, especially people who are using seed, the seed warming mats in the wintertime, you're really going to want to monitor uh, moisture levels in your bin and regularly mist the top of the bin because uh, that heat is going to dry stuff out and you want to make sure that stuff remains moist. So yeah, I would recommend a daily misting possibly or every other day. Uh, just make sure that you're noticing that it's wet and not dried out by the color at least. Uh, oh, diatomaceous earth, is that, uh, that's not what I was trying to think of, but if that works, that works uh, for lowering pH. I think that what's that person's referring to. What do you think about carbon to nitrogen ratios in a worm bin for startup? slash harvesting upon said ratios completion. So uh, it's the carbon to nitrogen ratio. I think we mentioned that last week. Uh, the carbon to nitrogen ratio of inputs is going to be way different than what you're going to get for the output. Um, I, a lot of people get really particular when they're building a compost pile, like, okay, I've got one bucket of this and this is 30 to one and I've got one bucket to this and this is 100 to one. And I'm not trying to make fun of people by saying that, but um, it's really, I've done this for years professionally and I've, it's not that big of a deal to focus on that close of stuff. Just uh, try and focus on two parts, brown carbonaceous material to one part. Uh, but yeah, yeah, 30 to one in 12 to one out um, no, it, I mean, it can be higher. It can be even higher than the 31 going in, but on the casting side, yes, you're going to be somewhere, uh, 15 to 30, normally 15 to one to 30 to one carbon and nitrogen ratio. Uh, Clive said, excellent. Thank you. I turn it weekly while it's thermophilic. Awesome. That's good. 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 Yeah. When things are thermophilic, you especially want to be incorporating oxygen, 
Uh, and by adding air, you're actually getting things to break down quicker. And so you're getting to your ending point a lot faster. And with that, we are running out of questions. Uh, I had, uh, if you give me one second here, I had a couple of questions on an email this morning. One second, one second. And I'll answer those because I think it would be helpful to you all as well. Um, the question was, uh, somebody had is comp pre composting outside, but they had black soldier fly larvae in there. Is it okay to? Uh, is there anything I could do to keep them out of my worm bag? If you do compost outside and doing pre composting, and you do have black soldier fly larvae getting into that material, I would be very weary of bringing that in and and putting it into your worm bin. But if you that were to happen. You can take, uh, it's likely to have happened because you don't have enough brown material or things are really too wet, but you could take some of that material, uh, set it aside in a small bit and allow it to dry out and get some air. And that should really drastically reduce the uh, black soldier fly larva in there. And then you could take that after maybe a couple weeks to a month and add that to your bin. Uh, and then there was a couple other questions with that. Uh, is there anything to worry about with adding bleached white paper to a worm bin? Uh, no, I've never worried about uh, bleached white paper. Uh, the only thing to be concerned about when you're using paper or cardboard products is that you don't want to be using the, um, uh, God, I'm having a real brain fart now, um, the glossy paper. So glossy paper can have PFAS. That's another week, Wiggle Wednesday we did, PFAS. Uh, which are the forever chemicals, uh, and they can have some other bad stuff in there, like heavy metals and stuff that you wouldn't want to be putting into your worm bin. So be, don't use glossy paper, but anything that's uh, not glossy should be okay, and generally newspapers printed with soy ink. Um, and then the last question that they had were, was, are there any plant materials that are off limits to worms? Um, I was saw that question earlier, and there wasn't. there's not anything that I can think of other than um, oils and fats can cause some issues in a worm bin, but if you're pre-composting material, uh, putting that stuff through the pre-composting process shouldn't be an issue. Uh, and then I've got a couple, question that popped up here. What are your thoughts on adding leaf mold along with worm castings when making compost tea? Um, leaf mold's not gonna really do anything to the compost tea. Um, I mean, unless there's saprophytic fungi that's in the leaf mold that you've gathered from the soil, uh, which may be beneficial, but also that stuff hasn't gone through the composting process. So, uh, you know, you potentially are adding something bad, but it's not likely that you're going to, but, uh, I don't see how it would really be a benefit. Um, you're going to get a lot more, uh, benefit by just using worm castings. And with that, I've come to the end. I'm gonna close out of here. Um, let's see here. I was trying to think of any announcements that we have. Uh, Steve and I are trying to put out a lot more YouTube content. So uh, be on the lookout for more shorts, uh, other things that we're putting out on YouTube other than our Wiggle Wednesday. Um, yeah, and then be sure to check out our uh, socials, so Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we just had a book giveaway on our Instagram last week, and uh, Raul Rivera won. I don't know if you're listening, Raul, but congratulations. Uh, he knows he won, but I just wanted to congratulate him again. Uh, and then next week, we are going to be talking about, uh, I've already got it put together, we're going to be talking about collecting saprophytic fungi to inoculate worm bins or compost piles. So beneficial fungi that's going to help to break things down in your bin and help to add uh, native microorganisms just by collecting a few handfuls of stuff from, um, from outside or from the forest. So check us out next week at Wiggle Wednesday, 11 a.m. on the 25th, January 25th. We'll be here next week. Uh, thanks for joining in today. I appreciate everyone being here and have a blessed week. See you, everybody.